about our media uh, project. Okay. So I will ask the first question. Uh, can you describe what the media options in the USA? Any options? We have of course the daily newspapers, not so many anymore as we used to have, but we do have um, television news, we have non-profit uh, news websites, and we have national public radio, we have some local public radio news, um, we have regular radio news, so there's quite a bit, and of course there's a lot on the internet as well, news magazines, blogs, all kinds of ways to get it. So it's pretty diverse, but it's, uh, there's a lot of problems right now. Yeah, the problems are consolidation and uh, shutting down daily newspapers. Um, newspapers, especially on the local level, are in a very profound crisis right now. Yes, yeah. Their revenue is not what it used to be because of things like Craigslist and online classified advertising has taken that income away from them. Uh, but also because uh, hedge funds, private equity firms have started buying up newspaper chains and they have no interest in the future survival of their papers, so they are not investing anymore. They're taking money out instead of making money. It's a very severe crisis right now. We're losing newspapers very quickly in the communities that no longer have a newspaper. Yeah, it's very sad. The next question is, can you evaluate of the media, like freedom of the press, safety, censorship, or media ownership? Uh, well, kind of related to what I just said, um, in terms of freedom of speech, it's not so much that anyone's getting censored as when a newspaper doesn't have resources and it doesn't have money to cover the kind of things it used to cover, it has the effect of censoring the news. For example, I worked at the Monterey Herald. We used to cover 15 different cities, and by the time I left, the, the resources were cut so severely that maybe we covered three or four cities. And so there's entire communities where no one's telling their stories, no one's watching their community leaders to see if tax money is being spent properly. So it's not a deliberate kind of censorship that we're experiencing right now, but it is the net effect of censorship because there are communities with no coverage. We call those news deserts because there's some places that just have no news. So you cannot cover all places. Right. That's why because censorship. Yes, yes, because there are fewer reporters. Um, mainly because the owners don't want to spend the money on reporters. They think they're too expensive. And they want to make more profits. So we lose that coverage. So, like I said, I don't believe it's deliberate censorship on that level. At least I haven't, I've never experienced deliberate censorship. But there is censorship by default, by lack of, lack of putting resources into your journalists. Oh. <laughs> well, a lot of us were complaining about newspapers like the Salinas Californian and the Monterey Herald have lost so many reporters. Um, and I was a reporter at the Herald, and so were several of my co-founders, and we just got very, very frustrated because we, we had to do more and more work with less and less time. And our readers were angry because we weren't covering our community organizations, we weren't covering events, because we couldn't, we just didn't have time, it wasn't even possible. So we wanted to create an alternative 
that could cover some of those stories that the newspapers can't get around to. So we don't replace those newspapers, but we're kind of supplementing them. Kind of the way a, a, a newspaper's Sunday magazine would, would cover, like longer stories, more in-depth, spend a little more time on them. That's kind of what Voices in Monterey Bay is trying to do. They're trying to be that Sunday magazine that used to be in the newspaper, but they don't have it anymore. So we're, we're doing stories they can't get to. So we're trying to just fill that void. Again, not to replace them at all, because we can't. You know, we can't be at every city council meeting either. There's only four of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, it's kind of uh, concentrate more than the general Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we try to be like like a magazine. So we'll have longer stories. Some of them are fun. Some of them are kind of historical, and some of them are investigations, breaking news. You know, trying to get public records from city councils. So we have a mix. Yeah, I think we also need the local ones, not the general public one. Because we can concentrate in one topic. Yes. Yeah, so and I, and I should add, in terms of who we concentrate on, we're very, very, we're, we're a bilingual magazine, so we, we also publish stories in Spanish, so we're very focused on the Latino community in the Monterey Bay area because they historically haven't had their stories told enough in mainstream media, so we're trying to fill that gap as well and do a lot more reporting on Latino issues in the Latino community. So, I, uh, do you think, are there any barriers or limitations? To what voices uh, to write, is doing? To write some articles? Oh, there's always barriers. <laughs> I mean, money. Ah, <laughs> money. Uh, you know, um, we, we hire freelancers to report for us. Um, but we, you know, we don't pay a ton, you know, we pay better than the Monterey Herald pays, <laughs> but not very much, you know, so money is always an issue of just being able to have full-time people. All of us who are founders of Voices of Monterey Bay, we volunteer a lot of our time. We get paid very, very little. Um, we try to save the money to pay our freelance reporters and photographers. So I would say that's the biggest you know, and also find trying to find sustainable funding. You know, we fundraise every year. We ask for donations, and um, and we get money from foundations as well. But you know, getting more stability there is, is that's our biggest challenge right now. Yeah, I saw you got you tried finding the supporters on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And we're very fortunate, a lot of our readers support us. We get, we raise, when we do fundraisers, we get a really good response. So we're very lucky that readers seem to want us. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, next one is how do people get to know the stories that matter to them? Um, how do they get to know them? Like, we use social media a lot to promote our work. That's probably the main way people find out about our stories. It's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And word of mouth. Uh, we also send out a, a weekly newsletter. So we have, I think, like 1,500 subscribers to our newsletter. So every week they know what stories are coming. So the weekly newsletter via uh, social media? Or it's an email yeah. newsletter. Oh, yeah. email. So we have an email list that people can sign up for. And so it's free and it's fun to read because it, it talks about what stories we're doing, but then we also pick some other stories around the internet and say, hey, check this out. Hey, this is kind of funny. And so it's, it's a fun thing to read. So we have a very uh, high readership rate of our newsletter. So what kind of article do you write in the, in the newsletter? Yes. 
anything like the four of us during the week will see something and we'll go, hey, put this in the newsletter. And it might be an article about our area, but it's not by us. It's in the New York Times or it's on a website somewhere. It's just something funny we found or something interesting. So we like to promote other people's writing as well. And it could be just last week we were comparing, there were April Fool's jokes. One sent out by the mayor of Salinas and another by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so we were comparing, like, who's was funnier, you know, just something silly like that. But it's fun, you know. News shouldn't all be depressing. <laughs> Sad, you know. Some of it needs to make people laugh, you know. Yeah, I like those things. <laughs> yeah, we like to mix it up. <laughs> So what do you think? Salina is funnier or Monterey is funnier? We thought the aquarium was funnier. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. They won. <laughs> After the after voices started, yes. yeah. After the foundation, um, I think it gives people some hope and some optimism about media and their community because a lot of the community was very depressed and upset seeing what was happening in the Santa Cruz and in California and the Monterey Herald, and just watching the paper shrink and shrink and cover less and less and less. Yeah. And it's very sad and depressing. And I think the main thing that Voices did, has done when we came along is gave people some hope. Oh, news is coming back. There are people still doing it. They're, they're being creative. They're finding ways to get these stories to us. And so I think it's created a sense of hope. Creative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because the other thing we do, besides we publish online, we hold events like every three, three months or so. We have a live event where we tell our new stories and we play some music. And we have performers and people read poetry and great food. And people come to those and just enjoy kind of seeing the news performed live. So it's our pop-up news magazine, I guess. I mean, we call it the speakeasy because we speak. <laughs> and it's sort of a gathering, maybe in a restaurant or a bar or in a place, a coffee shop. So we, we like to bring the news to life. People really love it. They love it. Yeah, it's kind of, it sounds like the best thing. Yeah, yes. It's like making it news fun, you know? Yeah, make it fun. And storytelling fun, you know? Because it's, it's not so much maybe the breaking news, you know, the governor did this or that it's more like, let's do a story about homelessness. Let's do a story about mental illness and look at the connection between the two. So we'll look at something. It's, you know, that's kind of might be sad, might be important, but we'll bring it alive. <laughs> who, who made that event? I think it was mine, but I stole it. No, because I stole it from Hop Up Magazine in San Francisco, because they do it, and I, and I went to, I took all of the Voices founders to go see them perform. We're like, we gotta do something like this, this is so cool. So, so we kind of borrowed that idea for fun. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Always borrow good ideas. Some new festival. Yeah, yeah, make it fun. Yeah. So when was the last event? Um, let's see. It was in. It's been a while. We're due for one. Um, the last one was in. In the, it was last fall, because it was our one year anniversary, yeah, and we were supposed to have another one in March, but one of our co-founders broke her leg, so we couldn't do it, so it's been postponed, but we do have one coming up in Watsonville, probably in another month or two. So it delayed, like, it's delayed, yes, oh, okay. <laughs> but not, not cancelled, <laughs> just delayed. Um, 
Oh, I should add too, one other thing that's very important that we do is we train young people to become journalists. Really? Yes. That's like a education? big part of our mission. We'll do a, like a two-week boot camp in the summer. Uh -huh. um, so the last two summers we worked with another guy named us, Marcos Cabrera is his name, and we worked with him and we taught more than a dozen Salinas high school kids, actually from all over, but mainly from Salinas. And we teach them how to be journalists, how to make phone calls, do interviews, get answers from City Hall, how to write, how to do podcasts. So that's a big part of our mission too, because a lot of these kids don't have a school newspaper, they have no way to learn this if we don't do that. And it's really important because even if they never do journalism, it teaches them so many skills and so much confidence you know, to be able to ask a question of the police chief, you know, and get an answer for a 15-year-old. That's a big deal. So it's very exciting to see the kids just get this confidence. That they didn't yes, have before. I think that's really important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a big part of our mission too. And a lot of them, English is their second language. Uh, but they're writing in English, so it's giving them confidence in the language, too. Oh, yeah. It's a really good program. Yeah. yeah, we're very, very excited about everything. <laughs> so if we or every domain events like the youth festival and the trainings? <laughs> yeah, the, the training was something we all knew we wanted to do from the get-go. That came from everybody. We all knew that was just going to be really important to us. We're called Voices of Monterey Bay because it wants, we want the voices of people who haven't been heard before to be known. And young people you know, don't have a voice a lot of times. So that's, that was very important to our mission. Uh, we also work with writers in prison because there are two prisons in Monterey County. And so we're working with writers inside, so we call those stories Voices from Inside. Um, we're not doing a lot of that yet, but we just, we, did, we have a few writers and we want to start to do more and maybe go into the prisons and train prisoners how to be journalists. So that's another part, because they're, they're in our county, but they don't have a voice. Yes, <laughs> so, yes, yes. So that's the idea, find the people who have no voice and find ways to tell their stories. Let them tell their stories, I should say. Help them tell their stories. And that's what is, if you can change something in media, what do you do and how? <laughs> oh boy, I would definitely take it out of the capitalist model. Capital? Capitalist <laughs> model. Uh, the business model is wrong. You know, the idea that you need to sell advertising to the readers in order to pay the reporters. It's like this triangle. <laughs> you know, where you don't, the readers aren't paying. The advertisers are paying you to give the readers to the advertisers. So it's a very convoluted business model. And I think that really needs to change. I think we need to find ways to get more nonprofit news. We need to probably find tax breaks and subsidies. The government really needs to recognize that you know, news is protected by the Constitution. It's the only industry that's specifically mentioned in the Constitution in the First Amendment, the right to free speech and the right to a free press. So we need to find ways to support our media. I, to me, that's the biggest problem, is that it's still based on this capitalist model of selling advertising, and it's not going to work in the long run. You need to find other ways to support it and decide. You know, this is just as important as having a park in your town. Well, the taxpayers pay for the park, but no one pays for the news. So we need to find ways somehow, either through nonprofit foundations and our government support, some kind of government support. And you know, that model has worked in Canada and in the UK, where we have the BBC and the BBC, and those get that kind of support. And it's still a free press, the government isn't controlling the media, so there are ways to do that to support the media without control. <laughs> so the BBC also controlled by the government? Yeah, they're paid uh, for by the government. What about CNN? No, CNN is 
private company. Really? Yes. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. So the only equivalent I would say in the United States is PBS. And yeah, public broadcasting and NPR on the radio. So those do get government subsidies in this country, but they're the only media that does. Yeah, so I think that needs to get expanded to more news outlets. So uh, we can believe or we can trust the CNN? <laughs> I believe, look, I think there should definitely every news story you read you need to use some skepticism. So you can trust some things on CNN and other things you might ask questions. And the same thing for Voices in My Radio. You, know, you need to think about who is the reporter telling this, what kind of sources are they quoting. Do I believe the sources? Have they asked enough people? Have they done enough research? You know, every news story you should be a little bit, you know, skeptical and ask yourself, can I trust? I wouldn't just say across the board, I trust everything. Because I trust nothing seen in this. Those are both extreme. You know, we need to be careful consumers of news. Um, one of the things we need to teach more is that kind of media literacy, like how to understand if a news story is is very well sourced and how to understand if it's actually opinion disguised as news. I think those things that we, the citizens, need to study and learn, I mean, should be taught in the schools how to understand news. We teach that in our youth workshops. We teach them how to, how to critique the news, how to understand if it's fake news or news. Can you give me any example of how to use the true news Sure. I mean, I would look at, first of all, where is it being published? Is it being published in a reputable site? Um, or is it just some Facebook post or a blog somewhere that may or may not have credibility? So look at where, where it's being published first. And then, you know, just read the story and look at who are the sources, where they say they're getting their information from. Because fake news usually won't have an actual source. <laughs> you know, they'll just say, oh.